Hello, and welcome back to Work Inspired. I'm your host, George Lucas Pfeiffer, and today, another great guest. Jeff Kraut Kramer is here from Madison Air. He's their CHRO, or Chief Human Resources Officer. He's going to tell you about their company and how they're delivering ROA, or Return on Air, for businesses, how they're implementing a frontline obsession with their employees, and how they're creating a culture of entrepreneurship where they're building for a better future. Work Inspired starts right now. Jeff, thank you so much for being here. Really excited to have this conversation and uh, appreciate you making the time coming into Chicago to do this with us. Yeah, it's great to be here. I'm excited. It's, you know, these are always fun to, you know, it's fun to, to talk about what we're doing and, and, you know, some of the unique things that I think we're doing that, you know, maybe someone can like, huh, oh, we should, we should pick up and do something like that too. Excellent. Well, we'll start with an easy question, hopefully. Tell us about yourself. What's your professional story? Yeah. So I'm a Midwestern guy. I grew up uh, in, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and, uh, you know, my it fits it fits the narrative. My first kind of will job, not will job, but when I was in school, I uh, I worked at a cheese company. So you know that that fit Very the narrative. Wisconsin, yeah. I went to school at the University of Minnesota, psychology major, and uh, my first I got into HR because my first internship was at that same cheese company the next year. So I worked in the factory the first year, and I they put me in HR because I was a psychology major and uh, loved it. And finished my undergrad, went to Michigan State, got a master's degree in HR, and then sort of. Did a bunch of different HR roles. I did GE for a while. Met my wife at GE. We both went there. Went, moved to Charlotte. Went to Bank of America, and you know, a couple other companies along the way. Spent uh, moved to Minneapolis uh, what five years ago. Took a head of HR role with a company called Starkey Hearing Technologies, and then joined um, Madison Air as the uh, Chief Human Resource Officer. Literally two years ago, yesterday. Wow! Well, congratulations Thanks. on your anniversary. And uh, and I. I was surprised when I started diving into Madison Air a little bit at the size of your organization. Yeah. For for a company that I hadn't heard of, you're big, you know. We so are. talk a little bit about what what is Madison Air? What's the company structure like? Uh, and that will help set the stage for I think this conversation. Yeah, we're, we're one of those companies uh, no one knows, but we're a private privately held company of eight thousand ish entrepreneurs. We call our employees entrepreneurs I like that. because we um, we're a collection of businesses that came together through. Uh, transformational acquisitions. Mm. Uh, we believe in decentralized business models, so you know we we our businesses keep their you know business name, mm -hmm. and, and we're all of our businesses is a collection of businesses that are about making the world safer, healthier, and more productive, mm. and and we do that through the transform transformative power of air, mm. and so that's where the Madison Air thing comes in. Yeah, and and if you think about how air is, we we forget about you know we forget about the air we breathe, right? We take. 25,000 breaths a day. And unless it's the air smells, you don't think about it. Mm. So I, I know there's a couple iconic products in your mm -hmm. in your portfolio, like big ass fans. Yep. Um, is is most of the are most of the products that you provide are they for the commercial setting or are you also in the residential space? We're both. Okay. Um, so we have big ass fans is uh, you know it's a fun it's a fun company to talk about. It's great culture in Lexington, Kentucky. And they have both a residential mm -hmm. brand and oh, they a do. product. I didn't know and that. And so, yeah, you, it's called the Haiku and some other products. Oh, I've heard but, of that. Yeah. Um, they're really big in sort of, you know, the commercial industrial space mm -hmm. of providing comfort, really, I mean, comfort solutions to, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, for most employees. Hmm. And so you said you have 8,000 entrepreneurs yep. around that. Uh, and those are dispersed across how many different companies? I always get this wrong, and I should know this. Um, it changes every week. Yeah, I think, you know, let's call it you know eighteen different kind okay. of companies wow. across the portfolio, um, things like big ass fans that that people probably have seen and known. Mm. Bro Newtone is another one of our companies. So think kitchen ventilation, bath fans. Mm. Um, you know, Nortec is is a brand. Nortec air handling solution. So think big, um, you know, stadiums, air handling machines. Mm. And, um, you know stuff like that. We do UV UV um, bulbs that go into those machines. You know we're in you know healthcare. We're cooling data centers. So we're kind of in all aspects of of kind of industry, and and it's all about that we turn. You know we call it return on air, right? Mm. People don't think about um, we, you don't think about air, but there's such power in in having you know what we can do with our products. It's more than just a box, mm. right? It's it's um, a solution for you know employers and um, acid protection and crop yield. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great place to work. I'm having a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, we'll talk about ROA in a yeah. minute. 
how though we talk about culture on this show a lot, yeah. organizational culture and often that starts at the top yeah. right from leadership and very often that's heavily driven by someone in a people leadership role like yourself so how do you navigate organizational culture at a company the size of Madison Air but that's dispersed across so many different businesses and different locations and even though they're all entrepreneurs yep. you know entrepreneurs are unique you know so how do you how do you allow them to to be decentralized and have their unique cult, you know their unique cultures and brands but also have some form of process or control around all that yeah i don't think it's about control i think it's about finding common commonality mm. right each of these businesses has their own culture mm -hmm. and and do i i don't think i ever see like there's going to be just this the one madison air culture because sure. one i think i don't know if any any big company has one culture because i think it's culture is really unique to um the leader itself mm -hmm. right I, I think leaders set culture mm -hmm. and so leaders who manage frontline employees have a culture for that team mm -hmm. and CEOs set a different culture. And so um, I think what I, what's important to me is it starts with how make sure you have, you hire great people mm -hmm. and you have people that share common beliefs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ours is make the world safer, healthier, more productive, decentralized, build great teams, growth mindset leaders. Well, that's that, that if you hire people like that with, different backgrounds, different perspectives, diversity of thought in background, you don't want to, you don't, you let that, that is important, but it's all around this commonality of let's make the world safer, healthier, more productive. Let's treat our employees, you know, right. Let's have a frontline obsession, mm. growth minded. And we're builders, right? We're, mm. we're a couple year old company and we're building something that is in the early stages mm. of, you know, where we think this company can go growth wise and, and impact we can have on, on the world. So, what I'm hearing is a shared vision and mission mm -hmm. that allows each company to do what they do in their own unique way. And that would be the culture of that organization yeah. or the leader at their organization. But you guys are all, you're rowing in the same direction. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Culture is a mirror of leadership. Mm -hmm. I think we've all said that in some way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, what that means is what's the, uh, the what, what's the, what, whatever the behavior you're willing to tolerate, that becomes the, the bar for what culture is. Mm -hmm. And so I think, What's really important is focusing on the, the people you have in leadership roles and mm. making sure um, they're going in the same direction. And we don't tolerate the asshole syndrome, if I can say that. If we yeah, can take that out, we'll edit that. it. But yeah. you know, it's like you need to be a good you know you need to be a good person who believes in treating people fairly and with respect. Mm. And, and I think we set that tone from the top, and and that sort of carries out through our organizations. You talk about hiring the right people. Yeah, the barometer for who's a good person is sometimes hard to uncover in mm -hmm. an interview process, right? So so how do you how do you hire the right people at Medicine Air? You know, I wish it was 100%. You know, I think it's intentionality. Mm. Um, and it and it starts with, you know, and I spent when I when I'm when I'm involved in a hiring I spend a lot of time mm -hmm. and it's not you know, there's people who are like, "Oh, I know in the first 15 minutes if someone's the right candidate." I'm like, "There's no way you can know that." Yeah. Right? It's it's intentionality, very clear you know, I call it a scorecard. What am I hiring for? Not a mm. job description, but like, what do I need this person to be able to accomplish in the first year or the first two years of that job? Mm -hmm. And so I'm hiring like Kelly, you know, you know, if I want someone who wants to, you know, pick, pick a grow, outgrow a market 10%. Well, have they ever done that? Mm -hmm. And if they haven't, it's pretty hard to say, well, you, now you're going to go into a new industry, new team and go do something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's very, it's, it's about being intentional. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and investing the time. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's, there's in the world we live in, there's there's a ton of opportunities to get behind the, you know, backdoor references, mm -hmm. right? And, and mm -hmm. spending the time. And, you know, I, I, I ask people, like, hey, who should I call? Like, mm -hmm. and, I, and spending the time to do it. And, and then um, having multiple, multiple people talk to them and, and calibrating, like, yeah, do we think this person has the skills we want? And do they fit, you know, mm -hmm. Well, you know what what, what we're looking for, mm -hmm. and again, I don't want carbon copies of you know Jeff Krautkram or, or anyone in the business. But do do they do they have the shared beliefs of mm -hmm. empowering people, building teams, um, getting on growth, being an entrepreneur, bias for action, right? So our you know our, our entrepreneurship, bias for action, and trust are our three values. Mm -hmm. like, so how do you do, do through your conversations with people? Do they do they display those types of um, leadership traits? Bias for trust. That bias makes, for action. Oh, bias for action. Trust, oh, and, trust. and entrepreneurship. Okay. okay, that makes sense. So 
your workforce, obviously there's a lot of manufacturing, right? Mm -hmm. So what kind of percentage is manufacturing versus knowledge worker? 80% of our workforce is, you know, building products that make the world, you know, safer, healthier, sure. more productive for us. Okay. And so that's an easier question because you know those people are going to be at a plant. They're going to yeah. be, they, they've got to be there to make the product, right? Yeah. The, now, the other 20%, when you're hiring the knowledge worker, does place matter at all? Or are you guys hiring fully remote individuals? Or are those individuals still t kind of tied to the manufacturing process because they're managing the team that they're, if the business they're in? How's, yeah. how's the way of working structured? Currently? Yeah, there's no one answer, yeah. right? Um, more times than not, it's, hey, you know, we need you in Madison, Wisconsin at mm -hmm. our, you know, thermostore yeah. business because that's where 80% of our workforce is. That's where the product's made. There's, you know, teams, you know, remote work has been great and, mm -hmm. it, and it's allowed a lot of flexibility, but there's nothing, you cannot replace the collaboration of being together as a team. Mm -hmm. And so I think every business and companies have navigated that differently. Um, but, it, you know, it, it's hard to, it's hard to, you know, be in a, in a relatively small business and not show up every day if you have eighty percent of your workforce is on the manufacturing floor. Yeah, and I think where my question is almost getting to it as it relates to the hiring process yeah. is do you find that it's necessary to have a person personal interaction when you're identifying someone to be part of the team? Or have you found an effective way to do it over a I, Zoom call? Yeah, no, I, a good question. I think I think I have. I've gotten comfortable of doing it over Zoom and in teams. I think we've just I think the you know the, the pandemic forced us to get comfortable mm -hmm, with it. Mm -hmm. If you would have asked me four years ago, would I ever hire someone without looking you know across the way? I'd be like, no way. Mm. But I, I've done it a lot, and um, it goes back to intentionality, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think too, you know, we'll talk. Uh, the culture is such a big, uh, an important piece, and we'll talk a little bit more about having fun at work yeah, yeah. and and uh, the the front line obsession and um, what though is changing about the recruiting process as it relates to technology you just talked about a shift in three years to, to be maybe more virtual or be more comfortable using something mm -hmm. like zoom or teams to, to to interview a candidate and feel comfortable about that candidate on both sides mm -hmm. candidate as well um but are you seeing any other changes ahead whether it's with ai or with recruiting uh service providers. I don't know. I mean, it, I know we've just gone through a really hard time of finding people, right? Yeah. The labor market was tight. Unemployment's really low. And clearly nothing's going to trump having a great organization with a great reputation and people want to come work for you, mm -hmm. right? But outside of that, is the, is, the, is, the, is the world of a people leader, is it is it getting easier? Is it getting more complex? Yeah, I don't think it's getting easier. No. I, I don't think... There's nothing that tells me that it's easier to find talent mm. than, that, than it was, you know, a year ago. I think um, really good people are in, in high demand. Mm -hmm. You know, I think AI is is sort of this interesting um, tool that you know I I know I'm not as as educated and deep as I want to be in it yet. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you know, does that allow us to get a lot more you know precision on you know your Screening searches with LinkedIn? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think it's like all things in in, in business. Is we just got to continue to adapt. Mm -hmm. And AI, like I'd say, I think I'm behind. But like, what do I need to, do to get up to speed? And, and that'll that will change the recruiting game. Mm -hmm. um, remote work and people. You know, you you get a lot of people who are like, nope, I'm not moving. I'm I'm not going to move anymore. I think relocation of people is way down. Mm -hmm. And so it limits your your pool, mm -hmm. and so you just, you know you got to adjust, and, and it forces you to have conversations on some of the knowledge jobs of like, oh, does this job really need to be physically in person? Mm -hmm. Can they commute? You know, are we come. And it, there's, it just there's so many different conversations that happen as you're hiring, mm -hmm. and you know I think it's it's really important to be um, clear and have clarity on what you're looking for, and and not and not really waffle, right? I think I've seen sometimes where it's like. No, they have to be in person. And mm. I've been working on the search now for six months and I can't find anyone. So, well, maybe they donate more. Like, well, there's a reason you made that decision in the first place. And unless that's changed, stick with it. And right. then same time, have flexibility to be like, no, this is a role that, you know, interactive is, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work very well to be remote and mm -hmm. flexible. And so I think this this world of hybridness is here to stay. And, mm. and um, it's, it's up to teams and organizations to... Um, sort of run into the storm, if you will, of what that is and say, yeah, we're going to, there's no one, there's no one size fits all. And as long as there's 
equity behind why we're doing what we're doing, great. Yeah. So. Well, and I realize that when I when I talk to people leaders, I have a tendency to talk about attraction more than mm-hmm. retention, but retention's more important probably than attraction. Yeah. And employee experience, and I mean, I think that there's ways that technology is probably going to enable more effective or or a more positive employee experience mm-hmm. and 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 lead to better retention maybe in a company like yours that is decentralized and is spread out across multiple companies there's a way for some shared best practices or or, or synergies yeah. um but uh yeah i think you're right change is ever present and intention is probably the most the best way to uh, yeah. approach intentionality it intentionality right? and, yeah. and clarity clarity of what you want to go do mm-hmm. and then being able to communicate the why behind why you're doing it. Mm. Yeah, I think that's, and that's, that's all. I mean, it's, I think that's what you probably want. So I just want to understand what we're doing and then why. Yep. And then I can get on board. It's, exactly. It, and so I think that's what most people ask. And I think sometimes leaders forget the, the why. Mm. Mm-hmm. And it's harder than it sounds. Oh, easy. Yeah. yeah. It's easy to talk <laughs> it. It's, I mean, it's hard to do. <laughs> it is. Uh, so tell me a little bit more about this frontline obsession yeah. uh, with your employees. What does that mean, and why is it important? Yeah, I, I love, I love that we're, we're focusing on it first of all. And I've been, I've been in HR for the, whatever twenty some years, and, and mostly been in manufacturing companies. And in a way, it didn't even dawn on me until I joined here. And you know, great thought leaders like you know Joe Wyant and others who are like, yeah, we this is this should be different. And I think COVID forced us to be different, right? Mm-hmm. You go back to the pandemic, they're all essential workers. They kept businesses alive because they showed up every day while, you know, you and I were working from our basements or whatever it was. They kept America going because they made the products that, that were important. And, and, and that forced our shift to mm-hmm. say, well, wait a second. You know, there's, why is there a wall, physical wall? Most You go to any manufacturer, there's an office and there's a wall, usually a door to get out to the manufacturing site and, you know, but there's a mental wall. Mm-hmm. And so what we've been on a, a journey on, and an obsession is about this, like you preoc- you keep thinking about it, right? the word obsession itself. And it's a, I think it's a great word because we can't lose sight of, we can't be one and done on this focus on frontline obsession is. Mm-hmm. Why do we have to, why, why are there two standards? Mm. Why, why is my flex, why do I have such flexibility in my job, but the person who's making one of our products gets a point if they're late for work? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we've, we've been, you kind of, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a great tool to look at. Well, what are the basics employees? Do they have living wages? Are we paying people a living wage so that they can, you know, support their families? Is it a safe and comfortable, you know, safe, is it a safe place where no one's going home hurt? Mm-hmm. Um, do they have a voice? And you kind of work your, say, up, up, work your way up the pyramid. And so we've taken that approach and we're looking at our workforces. We're, in a lot of our facilities, we're killing point systems. If you're on the manufacturing floor and you have a child and I have a child, you you have the same right. responsibilities that I do, and if I'm five minutes late because hey I had to talk to a teacher, or whatever I had to do with, with with my kid, no one cares. Like oh yeah, hey just join hey we'll catch we'll catch you up on the meeting right right. If you're a man and a lot of facilities around the world or in the U S. If you're late, oh well I'm sorry I'm sorry you you had to talk to your teacher. Here's a here's a point you you know you you only get five more and then you get fired. Mm. That's not that's not that's not how you want to work, right? Yeah. It's this fear-based, it's a, it's, it's a approach from the you know, 1940s or 50s mm-hmm. that we can be better and we can adapt on. So let's engage our workforce. What do you want? How do we, how do we give you flexibility? You know, are we man- are making it overtime mandatory? Mm. I don't know. How do, you know. Again, you put yourself in the shoes of, mm-hmm. if someone tells you, no, you have to do this, what's your reaction? Right, right. So really just taking a very, you know, like how do we, how do we break down the wall between our front line and our office and say, Hey, we all work for the same company. We're all, we all have a job to do in our mission to, you know, build great products for our customers that make the world safer, healthier, and more productive. So let's 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 change kind of how we approach that stuff. How much of that process? You've got your office worker, your mm-hmm. knowledge worker, and your your factory, your floor worker. How much of it is moving the manufacturer worker closer towards the experience that the office worker has? Or is there any bit of compromise where you're saying, we're gonna hold our office workers to the same accountability level that we're, we're you know, we're having for our, our factory yeah, workers? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great question. I don't know if I've actually really even thought about it in that framework, because it's, it's, it's so, it's, it's the, the easy stuff is to be, hey, let's 
let's get the uh, the manufacturing up to s- the same standard. Right. I mean, you know, one of the things you do when I walk a manufacturing floor is I go use the restroom in, in the manufacturing. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's very, in a lot of cases, and we've, and we've done, I'm so proud of what we've done is we've, we've changed, we've cleaned them up, we've spent the, the capital to improve them. But in the past, it was, it was a dirty bathroom mm-hmm. and the, the office one was great. So mm-hmm. how do you, how do you do that? I think it's a, it's about what do we want our company to be about? And then sort of saying like, hey, how do you, how do you not have, how do you break down the, the, the you know, if you will, the two, two class systems. Sure. And so does that mean we have to pull our office folks to do step up and do something different because, um, you know, they're not pulling their weight. And, and you know, one of the things we ask a lot of new hires is go work the manufacturing floor, go, yeah. go do the yeah. job that you know what, what it's like and what we're asking people to do. Yeah. Um, you know, if we're going to ask people to come in and and work overtime, do we? Ha- are you doing it too? Right. Mm-hmm. So it's it kind of goes back to that comment. I think that culture is a mirror of leadership. What are you willing mm-hmm. to do as a leader if mm-hmm. you're asking someone else to go do it? Yeah, I was thinking. I was having a, a conversation with one of our clients last night, and this is relevant because we were talking about the equity conversation between in person and remote workers. Mm-hmm. Yours is a little bit different, but from the same perspective there's a lot of effort in some organizations around making sure that the remote employee has the same equity, you know, that they've got the same experience as Mm -hmm. those in the room, whether that's the way that the the conference room is set up or the technology experience or whatnot. And I thought, this was the first time I thought that is, well, they're not the same. Yeah. You know, so like the person that's remote, even you might have a rule against it, but they can just turn off their video and step out of the meeting. Yeah. People in the room, that would be very awkward. Yeah. Or they can go on mute and talk to the person that, you know, down the hall to say, oh, answer the door for me. Wouldn't happen in the meeting, right. you know? So I wonder if there's a, a different but equal layer to this where you strive for an employee experience that is equitable in equality, yep. but recognizing that the office worker and the manufacturing worker are inherently different jobs, you know? Yes. And so maybe that makes solutions a little bit more bountiful. Yeah, you know, and, and, and I think it's, I think where we where people get chosen when we think about equal. Right. Because, right, I mean, jobs are different, right? Right. But equitable, what do we, how do, what do we need to do for the situation that the person is in, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I think, like, look, the nature of, of making a product is you have to physically be there. And, for the most part, kind of at a set schedule. Right. But the equitable piece is, what do we need to meet that employee where they are based on what's going on in their life? Mm-hmm. We're not going to treat someone who's doing accounting the same way because there's fu- their, their jobs just are drastically different. You can close the books at 9 o'clock at night if that's what we need mm-hmm. to go do. Mm-hmm. But we have to hold them to the same, expe- you know, the same standard of, of output of, a qual- of quality of work. Mm-hmm. So I do. I think it's not about equal. It's about equitable. And I also think that there's something to be said, and this is a little bit further removed from, but you look at a, a manufacturing line mm-hmm. and you need the team there. You, mm-hmm. If there's someone's missing on that, mm-hmm. that line, there's a bottleneck and it stops or yep. slows down, yep. right? I don't think it's, I think office workers are in a similar situation and flexibility is great. We talk about it a lot yep. on this show. It needs, it's, it's one of the, the positives that came out of the pandemic. But if you're not together working, I think you lose efficiency because you do, it takes more time. Yes. People are at different paces. They might be, you know, doing personal errand at three and you're waiting for that person. So I think that there's actually things that you can learn from the manufacturing line that are directly relevant to the office. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. I think you look, good things come from all things. Mm-hmm. And, and I, you know, I think there's a lot of things that are more efficient being remote. And, and like you said, for those, you miss the collaboration. Of, yeah. There's there's a difference between hey can I grab you for five minutes mm-hmm. in the hallway versus trying to schedule a meeting right it's just the the productivity in the, like half an hour blocks yes. that we only have so many right, of, right? Yeah. So, yeah yeah I think, I think that's what it's about and that's you know go back to why we're so focused on frontline obsession mm-hmm. is eighty percent of our workforce is you making our products and we've learned and we're, we're still not all the way where we need to be is we we got to they have to have a better experience mm. than, than, than they have in the past. Very interesting. I want to talk about the, the ROA. Yeah. Um, but before we get there, because we're talking about work culture and work experience, this fun at work concept, yeah. any, any advice? I mean, I know that that's, uh, we're all in the business of being profitable, yeah. right? And, so, and some leaders look at fun as the anti-profitable. We talked about this yesterday on an episode, and 
you know, fun at work or creating a great place to work or a great working environment often leads to more engaged employees, more mm -hmm. loyal employees. So there's a lot of um, positive impact. But if you see somebody not working <laughs> because they're, you know, playing shuffleboard or, you know, how do you, how do you balance the two or how do you promote fun, but still drive business results? Yeah. And I don't, I, I don't know the exact percentage, but we all spend a lot of time at work. Yes. Right. And I think they usually say you spend more time at work than you do with your family. And, and so I think that's the role of, you know, teams and leaders is to, you have to like the people you work with. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that can be fun. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, pausing every once in a while and to say, Hey, let's celebrate. Yeah. You know, like, Hey, we, we, we said we we're going to do X, Y, Z. We did it. Let's go. Let's, let's celebrate. Let's bring the whole team together. Let's have lunch. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, we do, we do a lot of things across our, our businesses. Like, Hey, we hit a, a milestone. Let's, you know, let's bring in lunch for the entire organization, figure out what works for your culture and, mm -hmm. and yeah, not, not stopping and like raising your eyebrows or like, well, yeah. how, I can't believe you have time to play, you know, you know, if you have a shuffleboard or to, you know, sit there and just, you know, have a conversation, have a conversation yeah. for 30 minutes. Yeah. Like we should, we should celebrate it. Mm. We're going to drive for the results. How you get there doesn't matter. Right. Mm. Well, I mean, how you do it matters, but like it's, you got to have fun doing it along the way. There's yeah. it, I mean, I love the, I love the team I get to work with. And if I didn't, I wouldn't want to spend as much time as I do. And it's also kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Success is fun. Failure is usually not, right? I mean, absolutely. Uh, it's failure is necessary, but success is fun. You learn a lot from yeah, failure. Yeah. So, but you're right. I don't think you can ever look back at, you know, you look back at some of the the hardest times in your in your career. You're not like, I didn't have a lot of fun. There. I, I learned. A, I learned yeah. a lot. Yeah. yeah. And when things are going well, when business is performing, it's it's a lot easier to like, yeah, to, mm -hmm. to have fun. And so I think it's, you know, job of of leaders and managers and just influential leaders and come like let's let's stop and and recognize and you know celebrate the, the, the little things sometimes mm -hmm. i think we're easy, it's really easy to to celebrate big milestones sometimes mm -hmm. you just gotta uh celebrate the mile the small milestones mm -hmm. and having somebody having the right people on your team yeah. that's got to be a major player in this as well you know you've got uh, i i know some some organizations will have like a chief fun officer, yeah. you know, like they really try to be intentional about creating fun experiences. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that, but I think if you've got the right people that embody that employee first, mm -hmm. you know, value, uh, you're probably going to have more, an, a more enjoyable experience. It's got to be working. authentic, yeah. right? I mean, mm -hmm. my big thing is people have to be willing to bring their full, whole authentic self to work. Mm -hmm. And my idea of fun is going to be very different than your mm -hmm. idea of fun. And we just got to be open to it. And I, I think it's a, at the end of the day, I think you got to work for someone. You got to, if you like who you work for, so if you're respected and you're valued and you're appreciated, that in general sort of just makes it fun to, to be there. Sure. Very true. So we just, you know, I think we all, I think every lead, one of the questions we ask on our annual engagement question is, have you recognized someone in the past seven days? Hmm. And everyone hates the seven day part <laughs> because it's like, well, I have, but I don't know, seven days, like that was last, you know, Thursday. Like, no, I don't think I've, you know, and, that's the intentionality of like, well, yeah, but if, if we did that regularly, mm -hmm. how, you know, people would be, it'd be a better place to work. So yeah. the seven days, there's value to asking it in the seven days. And how great would it be if you felt appreciated and recognized and given feedback mm -hmm. on a regular basis? I mean, I, I love the, the recognition piece, but I wish all organizations were better at giving just direct and candid feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, that's, it's probably one of the biggest challenges for any people leader is the, willingness to give candid and direct feedback. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I would I would argue across corporations, we're all just, we're average at best at it. Hmm. It's true. If you're doing it, if it's a weekly ask, it's it becomes a habit or a process, then a check the box once a quarter or once a month type of a thing. Right? And it, you and know, it doesn't become um, a big deal. You mm -hmm. know, it doesn't become, yes. a, oh my goodness. Like what just happened? It's right. Like, hey, I, you know, I saw this happen in this one meeting. Let me just tell you, you know, here's what I observed and, yeah. You know, here's what I think you could do better, and here's what I think you did really well. Mm. If that's a regular practice, that's, that makes that makes working together a lot easier. It's more natural. Yeah. And then yeah. you see people start giving it to you as well, yeah. right? And you're like, oh, yeah, you're right. All right. ROA. Yeah. What is return on air, and why does it matter? Um, return on air is, you know, the easiest answer is just better for business. But yeah. think about, I said 25,000 breaths you take every day. Uh -huh. And you think about... Um, you're, you're a company. Why, why would you buy, why would you invest and buy a big ass fan? 
because you care about the comfort for your employees. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of studies out there that if you're if your workforce, you know, depending, I, I, I should have brought this coming in, but heat matters on productivity, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if your employees are more comfortable, they're going to be more productive, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a return on air, right? You think about, um, you know, so people can listen to this podcast later mm -hmm. on is the data center. Mm -hmm. Well, we provide a solution to cool data centers. Mm -hmm. That's return on air. Mm -hmm. Crop utilization, you know, is the, the right humidi humidity in a greenhouse. Mm -hmm. That has a return on air. So mm -hmm. it's this idea of getting beyond just the, the uh, the box we provide sure. into the solution we provide for for your business to um, you know what, whatever you're doing. So it's comfort for employees, asset protection, crop utilization, all that. So so let's focus just on the people one because I think there's a lot yeah. of avenues we could go. How do you measure return on air as it relates to people? Is it satisfaction surveys? Is it health reports somehow? Is it is it other sensors that are collecting information on, around air quality or temperature control? Yeah, there's a lot of different things. That, you know, I think there's you can you can measure. Um, you could look at productivity based mm -hmm. on 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 heat or cold. Right, mm -hmm. it's amazing. You, you you talk to employees and hey, it, it's miserable in here. I'm super hot. As soon as you, you know, we we install a big ass fan in one of the, you know one of these uh, warehouses or factories, and people are like, oh, I'm happier again. Right, mm -hmm. it's because I'm comfortable. Right. Mm -hmm. and, You've, we've all worked when it's not mm -hmm. um, comfortable conditions, and you're not usually go back to the fun. You're not very fun, or it's not very yeah. happy, right? Yeah. So there's the employee sa um, employee satisfaction piece of it. Um, yeah, and you can, so you can measure some of it. And a fan is fairly easy to yeah yeah. Like it, it's it's hot in here. It feels stale in here. Turn on a fan, you know. And if it's a big ass fan because it's a big ass room, then we got better airflow and yeah. circulation. What about like? air quality yeah. do you guys do air purification like I, we talk i mean well building standards smart buildings it seems to be that quality whether it's light or sound or air mm -hmm. into the built environment is more and more and more not po popular is not the right word but it's it's at the forefront of people's minds because it's more approachable now yeah. you know there's a lot more options that you can include are you guys seeing an increase is that one of the, the kind of your product lines yeah i mean yeah. i go back to well, i think i said 25,000 breaths a day. Yeah, right. 90% of them are indoors. Right. And then, you know, buildings um, are sealed up tighter for efficiency. And so we're just breathing. Unless you're having, exchanging that air, you know, fresh air systems, bringing air in, um, how much, how it's moving, it's circulating, you're breathing stale air. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think it's the, the, the quality piece of the the indoor air we breathe is, is just beginning. I think people have been mm. more aware of it. Yeah, I mean, it's staggering when you think about 25,000 breaths. It is. And unless you can smell it or see it, you don't think about it. And I mean, and then you, but you counter that with what we just went through with the pandemic mm -hmm. where everybody's installing these UV, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we at one point were pitched this product that sits right on the desk mm -hmm. and it sucks in air and spits back out cleaned air right into the employee's face. And I mean, interesting concepts for sure. Yeah. But People weren't really biting on it, and then sure enough, you wait long enough, and now there's you know is ozone not, not real good because of the UV emit like so there's it's kind of, there's there's a bit of a health mm -hmm. conversation around some of these devices, right? Absolutely. So I'm probably unlike a fan, you know, but no one's really arguing the use of a fan, but yeah. but some of these other technologies, these newer emerging technologies, how are you guys navigating that? Yeah, I think it's you know staying on the the forefront mm -hmm. of of what's going on, and I think we we are in, you know in the um, in a lot of cases, on the forefront of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we in our uh, our Brown business in, in outside Milwaukee, Wisconsin, you know, we have a product that you know about fresh air systems. How mm -hmm. often are you bringing in fresh air into a building mm -hmm. or into a home, right? Mm -hmm. Like, because that matters, right? And, yeah. that, and that's what you're trying to do is how do you get out the pollutants and the pollens? And, you know, there's other industries and, and businesses that do the filtration stuff. We're more on the uh, movement, the and, movement of, of air. air, but yeah, it's it's. I think we're all realizing it's it's going to continue to be on the forefront of what mm. people are thinking about, and it's you know good for us. It's good for business that yeah you know people are starting to talk about it, and it's they're using it to not just say hey I care about the cost of something. It's the what's the total cost of ownership, or what's the what's the benefit for the workforce or the building tenants, right? So there's it's bigger than just the the initial cost. It's what's the goes back to return on air. What's mm -hmm. the what's the long term return on air I get by making this investment? So if if a, if an organization is interested in evaluating the return on air at their company, is this more of a conversation for building owners and landlords and people in commercial real estate, or is it something that 
business owners sh should be proactive in approaching? I think it's it's everyone, right? Everyone, I mean, yeah. if if um, if if you're a business owner and and you have um, you know heat in your in your business or you're not moving your air or you're ha you know, high demand, like yeah, you should be having that conversation because yeah. it's your employees are probably like, gosh, this isn't where I want to yeah. be. Yeah, you know, if you're trying to if if you know we provide solutions, you know, in hospitals, right, mm. and, and clean rooms, right. You think about how you know, you know um, operating rooms like. Yeah, you want to make sure you have the best, most quality uh, purified air. Oh, cool. Well, that's exciting. I definitely agree. It's a, you don't see it because it's air, yeah. you know, but it's certainly a critical point, a part of life and of our working experience and our home experience. Yeah. So, um, the 25,000 breaths, you know, kind of got me when we, so you started to hear that. Is that the, that's the average of a human in a day? Yeah, that's, wow. yeah, that's like, I, Funny aside, uh, shout out to our CFO. He was like, "Oh, we should brand the company 25,000." Yeah, bucks. seriously. That's why he's a CFO, not a marketing <laughs> guy. So, do, is I, I was going to ask you this: Is Madison Air is that the name originate from Madison, Wisconsin, or is it someone's last name? I think when they were looking for a name, I think they were, you know, their Chicago-based company. They're they were on Madison at Madison, oh, Madison Street, Avenue. and it was like, yeah. oh, and that just became and and there's you know. Um, there's there's value in that name, and we just instead of you know we used to Madison Indoor Air Quality, we mm -hmm. stuck with the Madison to get to Madison Air. Okay, what's next? What's something you're looking forward to in the next twelve months? Uh, just the, the the build, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we've been on a, a a fun journey, a fun ride. You know, we spent a lot of time over the last two years of really getting, kind of building out the leadership team of Madison Air, and now it's working with those teams and the different businesses to go just continue the journey of building great companies where. Um, you know, we're making great products. We have great, great, great workforces where people are highly engaged that they, they, you know, feel they can be their true authentic self at work and we're making a difference. Nice. So it's a build. I, you know, I, that's why this was such a fun job to join is not everything's perfect and, yeah. and building's fun. And like there's pull out your hair days of building too, right? Entrepreneurship, but, right? Yeah, but yeah. I, I'm a, I love yeah. to build yeah. and, and you know, you can look back and be like, oh, look what we got done. Yeah. So that's what's fun. That's what I'm looking forward to is just continuing the build. Excellent. Well, you've had a, a successful career so far. You've done a lot of cool things. You've lived in a lot of cool places. What's what's something that helped you along the way? What's a resource that you could recommend to others? I think it's it's not being afraid. I mean, a couple of things. I think it's someone's mentality. It's not being afraid to take the hard jobs. Okay. You know, doing like the job that no one else wants. I think we've all heard that before, but really doing it. Mm -hmm. And I can think of the, one of the jobs I had where you know, I led HR for sort of an off, at a bank for kind of their offshore business. And mm. it's like, you know, a lot of trips to India and Costa Rica. And that was hard. Mm. But I learned a lot. I learned a ton. Um, and I think it's working for people you really respect and can learn from. Yeah. Um, and not running away right away when you have a bad leader. Because mm. I think, you know, you can learn a ton from great leaders. And I've, I've been fortunate enough to work for a lot of great leaders. Mm -hmm. I've worked for a few bad ones along the way. And, you know, you learn from that. And you're like, I don't want to be that person mm. or I've seen what they know. And so how do I not do that? Mm. So I think it's, it's, um, being open to open to ideas, open to change and high thirst for learning. Mm. That's probably what I would say is never, and never being satisfied. It's great advice. And it's been such a pleasure talking to you. you sounds like you're doing some great things at Madison A or the culture you're building. Um, the values that you've set, uh, their perspective that you've got. I appreciate you sharing them all with us today. Yeah, this was fun. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to rate our show. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Work Inspired Podcast so that you don't miss any of the incredible guests we have planned for upcoming episodes. We'll continue to find the best and brightest minds in business so that you can learn, grow, and succeed, and so that we can all work inspired. Work Inspired is brought to you by BOS, a leader in commercial working environments and a Hayworth best-in-class dealership. Experience our 360 approach and discover the team, tools, and techniques required to navigate the complexity of your next workspace at BOS.com. If you have ideas, feedback, or would like to be featured on our show, please email podcast at BOS.com. Thank you for listening. This has been a Workspace Digital production. If you're interested in launching a podcast at your organization, please email info at workspace.digital for a free consultation.